that will break them. You flip them over, the air goes the wrong way and it does not operate the way it's supposed to. This way, you keep running just like this down the field, all the way down into the base. Pulley onto there. Do not set those with a drill, ever, please. Which is basic principle of the cooling tower. Your hot water from the condenser is coming into the top, going out through the sprayers, down your field, as the air is coming up through, cooling everything down and running back down through the basin, out back into the condenser loop, essentially. There's all kinds of different components in between there that can do different things, but that's the simple breakdown of it. Same thing with this one over here, except on this one, you're having the spray nozzles throw all the water straight down through the tower and the fan is pulling the air up through the fill to cool all of the water as it's coming up through here. And in the top section up here with where these drift eliminators are, those are actually really important because they keep a lot of the water into the system without evaporating into the air, which generally saves you a whole bunch of money on your water end. And then of course, most of your towers are always gonna operate off of some kind of a float mechanism for the makeup water. You always have to make sure that this is definitely covering up the pipe for your condenser water outlet. Otherwise, especially on a closed loop system, if you get any kind of air in that system, it's gonna throw all kinds of things off. It's gonna trip out air handlers, trip out units all throughout the whole property. And then your overflows are also super important. Most of those now around here require you to have some kind of mechanical system on there now to tell you whether or not you have an overflow to let you know how much water you're actually losing. Your motors up on the top that are going towards your fans, a lot of them will have belts running from the motor over to a pulley on the fan shaft itself. 90% of these will have pillow block bearings in between the shaft and the fan between the pulley down here. That's a pretty important part that you'll want to check every single time. There's um, a mechanical type beam that runs across both sides of this. A lot of times on either side that will crack. That's a super important thing that we need to actually look at. You need to verify that there is no cracks there because once the tower is running again and you're not sitting in there, you won't see the damage that it's going to cause because once that goes, it's done completely. So in your experience, when fan blades are off kilter or anything and they're hitting that shroud, is that more so caused by the bearings themselves or that beam going across? Well, if the, if the fan blades itself is actually hitting that cone around the top, a lot of the times that is gonna be that mechanical beam. Or if it's on a situation like this one, those pillow block bearings could have came loose on that shaft, there's all kinds of different things. But on most of your ones that have uh, it's a gearbox, right? Isn't that what that's called? Yeah. You have some, like uh, some of the towers that we walk into where you have the motor sitting in front here, then you have the gearbox here that goes up to the fan. That mechanical beam that's running all the way across, if that becomes loose, that throws that whole fan off, motor, gearbox, everything. And then on those gearboxes, it's actually super important that you check the oil in those things. If they're dry, it's bad news for that whole system and probably that motor too. And then the couplings that go on there also is a real important part to check, make sure there's not wobbles or anything like that. When you do the vibration readings on most of those, you'll know whether it's an alignment issue or whether it has something to do with the bearings, especially because most of the time the bearing, you can hear that. At least I usually can. Mm -hmm. So, and then on the blades too, a lot of those blades come fixed already at the pitch that they need to be but that's something that you can check also. Whenever you're looking at where the blade is lined up on that cone, if all four, five, eight blades, however many there are, if they're going around and one of them is tilted off, there's usually a way to be able to adjust it at the bushing. There's usually two bolts there that go through like a little U-joint and you loosen them up, you can set the pitch, and put it all back together. But if it is off, there's a reason why it was off. So we need to check that. <laughs> especially if all the other ones stay the same. Now, in both of these setups that I've drawn up here, this is more of your open loop systems, which are just super basic and easy. The cooling tower is always getting rid of heat 
That is exactly what the cooling tower does. That's all it does. Getting rid of the heat from the system, that's it. Now, to determine whether or not it's an open loop or a closed loop system, the easiest way is that there will be a spray pump down at the bottom of the basin, taking the water from the basin, running it up to the field and down the system to cool it off back into the loop. It's the easiest way to tell you. If all you see is condensers, pumps, and chill water pumps, it's more than likely an open loop system. It's the easiest way to explain that one. But, what else we got? <clears throat> so those spray nozzles too, especially when you're doing the fan PMs on them, or I mean the uh, cooling tower PMs, when you're pulling these out here, you can run the water without the system being on, and you'll be able to tell which ones are working and which ones aren't. Yeah, you want to see a pure yeah, spray. Yeah, some of them usually have like the little spiral to mm -hmm. where it just throws the water off and throws it evenly down the field. Some of them now actually have that little deal that spins while it's dripping down on it, which is really cool. But if, man, I think it's only like if four or five of them go down, that takes away like 10, 10 to 15% of the capacity of that cooling yeah, tower. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it was pretty significant whenever I was reading about it. So to my understanding, the way a closed loop would work is you've got your condenser water running through the heat exchanger, and yep. then you've got the, the cooling tower water, the base water, I don't exactly know what the term mm -hmm. that would be, but you're taking that heat and you're running, you're running the water across the heat exchanger, you're picking right. up the heat there, from there you're turning it into water droplets, and you're right. able to pull the air across it and move it that way. Right. And then you're cycling it through, which allows the water to continue to cool that way, whereas an open loop is you're directly using the air to from the building. From the building and you're right. going across the fill that way. Yeah, so I guess that's the easy way to explain it then. Mm -hmm. So on the open loop system, you're actually taking the water from the building and from all the equipment, running it out to the tower, it gets exposed to the atmosphere and then it runs back into the system that way. On a closed loop system, the water that's in the building and in the system never gets exposed to the atmosphere at all. The spray pump is taking all the water from the makeup line, pulling it out of the basin, running it from the top over the field and cooling the heat exchanger that way, which is then running all the water, the chilled water or cooled off water back to the system. Make sense? That's also the reason why when you're doing it on the closed loop system, you have to make sure there's no air in there. Yep. So once it goes back to one of those units, that's it. Especially the, one of those uh, self-contained self units. Yep. Those, they trip out super easy off of those systems. What else do we want to watch out for? Sump strainers? Yeah, the sump strainers for sure. You definitely want to make sure those are clean. Oh, when you're doing a PM on these things, and you're cleaning that, don't remove that sump strainer whenever you're using that vacuum. <laughs> Use the vacuum first, and then pull that out and get whatever made it through there. Because when you remove that thing, a lot of the times you're just pushing all the dirt down into there. And trust me, that's why you find all that nasty, dirty stuff all in those uh, strainers throughout the whole building all the time. It's gonna be too off the top of my head. Yeah, and if there is a strainer out at the tower, which I think some of them do have strainers out at the tower on the uh, outlet line, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times you can just valve it off there and clean it out there without it making all the way inside. Yep. And if you can shut down the tower and valve everything off to clean it, that's definitely the best way to do it. But if you have to leave it running, obviously if you can't isolate the tower, you're gonna have to either get wet or <laughs> get a really long vacuum because that's the only way that's gonna work. <laughs> yeah, and then another thing too on those uh, gearboxes that run up from the motor to the fan. On the front of those things, it's got a, what they call a pinion seal. If you see that there's an oil leak coming from that, always make sure to write that up because it will. It's never going to fix itself. It won't block the oil back. You have to get it replaced. Eventually, a lot of the time you can keep running it. It's not an immediate repair. Thing. Right, it's depending on how severe it is. Like if you see it running down the whole body, you see it mixing into the water down below you. You know it's severe enough to where hey, this needs to be replaced. Because once that thing runs out of oil, it's only a matter of time before it takes itself out, and then you're down the whole cooling tower. And then we well, talk about the beams that you need to mount it to. Yes. Yeah, the mechanical beams is a super important 
spot to check. And mechanical beams are different in most cooling towers. I mean, depending on which ones you're walking into, the mechanical beam can be all the way across the tower. It can be only in the small section up here. There's some where they have different setups where they have two or three motors on the same mechanical beam running all the way down. It just depends on which one you're looking at. They also have, uh, hold on, I'm not sure if you can tell me what the right name of them is, but the one where it's got the roundabout um, blower section where a shaft oh, runs all a, the way through it. It's a, um, it's a force drafts and triple. There you go, that one. The, the one with the blower wheel on the side? It just right. Forces everything. That's yes, right. it's actually where the blower wheel is on the outside of it and oh, it doesn't right. actually touch any of the water inside, mm -hmm. but it blows through the entire fill as the water's coming down. Mm -hmm. And it make, kind of cross, kind of crosses everything as it's running through there. But those, I mean, I don't know. Those are more rare, though. Yeah, I think those are more old style, older style. I think. Is there anything about it just window? depends too. Window. Yeah, there's a couple. It depends on what the building, what the building is going to be operating. It's the equipment that they're operating. It also depends on how many people are there. It depends on how big of a surface they're doing. There's all kinds of stuff that goes into how, what type of cooling tower they're gonna have. Yeah, so, okay, that was my question. What are the benefits of each type of cooling tower? The one we just talked about versus right. the, the two you have drawn there? Are there yeah. any like, benefits to each, or negatives to each of them? Or is it, it just kind of like- It just depends. Them? There's pros and cons to each of them. For instance, like the closed water loop system. You're definitely, I believe, saving a lot more money on a closed water loop system then you are an open water loop system, even more water evaporates in that cooling tower during the heat heating removal process. So in particular, it's all fresh Yeah, well, I'm not really sure on that though. As far as the insulation goes, the insulation on most of these things is honestly fairly kind of simple. It really just depends on what kind of system it is, exactly. Once you've determined if it's an open loop or a closed loop system, you know how many cooling towers you have, well, you know you have to have a condenser water inlet and a condenser water outlet. And you know you have to have a makeup water and a drain. That pretty much covers everything you need to run that tower. Minus, of course, all the small stuff, your electrical, all your sensors, that kind of stuff, whatever you're gonna be running. You also got basin heaters thrown in there with temp sensors. They got all kinds of stuff now that you can throw into these things. I mean, vibration switches too are a pretty important thing on this tower. Do you and know how to check those? The way that I always check the vibration switch, if you don't want to do it with the little hammer like what you're doing right now, there, but <laughs> <laughs> that will break them most no of the time, depending on how hard you hit it. But most of them, when you set them, you want to set the fan at 100%. If it doesn't trip at 100%, most of the time you have it calibrated correctly depending on when you go up there. If you whack the shit out of it, if you whack it, then, <laughs> dang, that one slip, sorry. If you whack it and it trips, then obviously you're okay. But you don't want to sit there and kill it, obviously. But most of them always come with a new, <laughs> just a tap man that's all you need most of the time what I personally do is I take my flathead screwdriver and I don't hit it with the handle side I just hit it with the flathead oh, side since when you hit the beam it's mounted to you yeah exactly that's exactly what I was going to say you hit the beam next to it which then controls the vibration switch and kills your signal most of the time if you notice that it tripped and it did not kill your signal something else is wrong and you need to start troubleshooting <laughs> That's why they keep finding out with all these dings in Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the vibration, the vibration switches are weird, too, because there's certain manufacturers that go off of different settings, so a lot of the time you'll have to read the book as to what they want. Most of the time what I do, I can't remember what the actual measurement is, but it's 0.4 is the setting that I always set it to, which is more in the middle section. More like with that iPad that we read the vibration readings off of, which would put you like right at about 1.0 of the uh, IPS, which would be like right in the yellow, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just tripping the tower enough to be like, hey, we have something going on, so we need to check it out. But you also don't want to set it to where the damn thing has to fall over in order to trip either. <laughs> it's just, it depends. And there's also so many different ones. There's spring-loaded ones that have the dry contacts in them, have the ones that use 24 volts, ones that use 120 volts, there's all kinds of different ones.
So it just depends on what you're using. All right. What else we got? Oh, for instance, on the outside of these towers, most of the time to access these, you know, the little square panels that they have there. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, Holden, but those are actually called louvers, if I'm not mistaken. Even though it has that plastic little fill in there, those are called louvers. And all that that is is just to divert the air in a certain direction into the tower. So it's more to install the correct? Exactly. If I have noticed that in the past before that somebody had flipped those all around. And you can put it in upside down, it presses it. Yeah, so most of them you can't because a lot of them have the little deflector on the inside of them that will keep the water flowing inward. That way you're not getting a bunch of water outside of the tower, but a lot of people have managed to do things sometimes. <laughs> it happens. I have noticed it. Yes. And also putting the fill back in correctly is very important as well. Because all of that stuff lines up a certain way and it all runs down. So like in most of these, for instance, the fill, the way the water would come down, it would come down this way and keep running just like this down the fill all the way down into the base. Well, if you end up crossing one of these pieces of fill that's in here and turning it this way, oh, I mean the same way that this one's running, well, then you're just going to keep pushing the water over towards the side. It's never going to reach down to the basin like it's supposed to. Because the amount of fill that's here down to here has been measured, I guess, by an engineer or someone to determine how much cooling capability the amount of air that pulls up through here will cool this water down by the time it reaches it. But you have to make sure all that stuff goes back in correctly. <laughs> I've done it before too, so. I feel like we're gonna hate you for this one, but I know we have some that like the fans underneath. Underneath the fill? I to get into it and see how the building you're going to tomorrow has one of them. Okay. How is that working? It's the only tower I have ever messed with that operates that way. And it is weird. It's very weird. I'm not. I still don't know how it works. I, 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 I understand. I have an idea, how it but I want somebody to like draw it out. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. So. Right. That has two bases in it, right? I, no. It only has, it it only has one basin. Comes in the middle, right. Know, it right. only has one basin, but the basin isn't a big, giant, square basin like you would normally see. It's actually like a track that runs to both sides of that tower. And the air from the bottom is supposedly blowing through those louvers that you see and opening it up. So that's hold on. Hold on. Yeah, no, yeah. The confusion is that way we can all better understand. Yeah. That. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Not a, oh yeah. Especially when they're like, go get vibration readers. And you're like, uh, yeah, on that one especially. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Why not? <laughs> First time you All right. You're going to have to touch me and that hole turn it on and it fall out. Fall down. Now that you got the wireless one, you know, it could be done. But you fall out and Is all the towers? Yeah, 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 that's all that's up there. There's a spray nozzle in there somewhere. Right, right. The spray nozzles, I believe, are right down. No, they're closer to the top. They were up yeah, there. They're, 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 the top of it is literally the uh, the drift. Oh, the very top is all the way up there. You got sprayers. You got fill finally. What you have it coming in here, right up at the very top. Yeah. And it's got big spinner ring. What? On the ends of those, uh, oh yeah, the, on the end of the distribution yep. line, yeah, that's running this way, and they're big things too. Yeah, like this is one of the ones I was talking about where it comes down and it's running across everything, like an old school sprinkler. Mm -hmm. But again, this one is an open loop system too, mm -hmm. so you're using all the water coming from everything the whole time. So it just depends on how much you're getting in there. And on this one, 
I remember yeah. the makeup's coming in on the side of it, right? Mm -hmm. There's like a little box. It's yeah. Like your flow switch and everything in your water level. And right. And then you got this is where your uh, return water is going back yep. in, right? Yep. Back to the system. Oops. Okay. So on this one, the only amount of water that's really staying in here is in this, what is it, like a two foot by two foot box that's on the side yeah, of that thing? Yeah. That's, it's just a small trough. But I haven't seen how big the, like, the troughs on the sides are, like, like how much water Like that runs, so on side. this one you have the air coming in, being pulled in through the bottom uh -huh. from all the fans. Which, when it's pulling in through here, you have all your fans. So then you have these louvers right here on the top of those fans, which open up to direct the air to go straight up through the tower. So that way it blows through the fill and all that stuff. The only part I'm not familiar with, you can help me with, is the basin portion of it. I think as far it's as I remember, a is it a U shape that runs all the way around it? Because I know it runs through the whole bottom of yeah. the tower. So, so my understanding is it's, it's got um, it's got a uh, like a, a set of um, panels that are that coming down the sides of the water wall. And, and it helps the air kind of come around those panels and the water kind of go down through to hit that trough in the middle right it, as yeah. far as yeah okay that's what i was thinking really weird because all the water is coming from up here on the top mm -hmm. yeah, so it's going into the center not on the sides right because See, on most of these, we've ran them whenever we have everything out of there, so we can usually see whenever all the fill and all that stuff is going. This one, you can't do that unless you want to have two guys having a ladder down in here no, in a 20 foot portion of the basin. And then once you get down low enough, then you're running into that wall that we're talking about where all the water is running down towards it. So on this one, all the water is coming straight down, running through here. So as it's running through here, there's a wall built off of both sides of the tower that then runs straight back to the center of the tower here and then all the water is coming right back in here so everything is just running into i think it's only like what a foot wide yeah it's, it's, it's on that like track a couple of foot square yeah oh, if that that's all that it is yeah that particular cooling tower is just fun with the water back in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so as the water's coming down, all your air is being forced through here by these louvers being directed into those fill, so that way it can release all the heat out the top. But then all your water is being trapped to go back down into the system to run so there's all the way back. Open and close to yes, as the motors are running. Okay. Yeah. And on those towers, each one of these motors run individually depending on how much it's calling for the system to come on. Right. So most of the time on that one, you're not going to see, most of the time it's set at uh, diagonal. They're not going to run one side of that tower because then you're only using half of the fill. So they'll have it staggered so that way everything can still be more efficient. And on that tower is, uh, yeah, it's funny. In particular. <laughs> That's a wild tower. Uh, it's a very, very sketch. One thing I think would be great to go into is um, uh, vibration readings on, on, especially the fans mm -hmm. uh, and the fan bearings, but even the even the motors for these fans and kind of how yep. how to interpret some of those numbers. Okay, so on on a tower setup just like this one here, that has your belt running over to the pulley for the fan and the pulley for the motor. On your motor itself, you'll take, you're actually going to take five readings on almost any motor that you're going to do. You, you're going to take five basic readings every single time. I'm going to draw a motor a little larger so that you can I guess I can. Actually, you want me to go get a motor? Yeah, if we want to. That'll actually help. Mm -hmm. But on here though, tension is a super important thing on this belt before you get into determining whether or not bearings are bad and that kind of stuff. If your belt is loose, you're obviously not gonna have any tension on this motor 
which is also not going to be giving you a load, which then in turn is going to cause your motor to not run as efficient, essentially. If the belt is way too tight, you're gonna know that because a lot of the times the beam that this is bolted to or the, uh, the plate that it's on will be tilted at an angle, pulled in to the front most of the time. Yeah, also that shroud that covers the pulley. <clears throat> will be dragging on that pulley. Do it? It'll be dragging on that pulley well, no, too. Yeah, like the shroud itself is sometimes loose and that can yep. the vibration rings off. But oh yeah. Gonna... Yeah, so a lot of the times you're talking about that little... Yeah, the little, it's got like a door. You can... Yeah, it's like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it covers like up hinge. the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, most of the time you'll want to take that off of there. Uh, if you can. Away from the ladder. But... <laughs> wish it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> On your motors though, any time that you think the bearings are bad, take whatever load on that motor off. I don't care if it's on there with a coupling, if it's on there with a belt, if it's on there welded, I don't care, cut it off, it doesn't matter. You gotta figure out if it's the actual bearings in that motor or if it's coming from something off this way. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the times, if the fan vibration is off, it will give you false readings down over here in the motor because everything's traveling back that way. So. Yes. What would you like to know? Maybe a horrible <laughs> question. But you just said like no the, horrible fan, question. the fan bearings are bad. Um, but it, you so see. So my question is, is, we can take the load off the motor yes. to test those bearings, but we can't take the load off the fan to no. test those bearings. Unfortunately. There's no way. But nope. if you take the load off and you were having a bad on the motor, and now all of a sudden you've got a good reading on your motor. Then you know that your problem is bad. If you have a bad bearing or an alignment issue right. or a messed up belt right. or a it is a process of yeah, elimination. Yeah, so once you remove the motor, you determine the motor's fine, but you've got bad readings all around with the load, yep. but then you know it's below. Right, because like I said, most of the time on a setup like this, you'll have pillow block bearings here mm -hmm. and here. If one of these two is bad, and it's significantly bad, you might pick that reading up all the way over here at the motor. Not likely, if it's to the point where it's eating the shaft up and the shaft is jumping, you'll definitely feel it, but I would hope that you would visually see that before having to need the vibration ring. <laughs> so it just depends, you know what I mean? On this though, once you do this and you confirm that the motor readings are good, you're gonna want to confirm obviously that your belt is good, the alignment. The alignment is super important. If the alignment is off, it will give you false indication that the motor's bad. Drawing, not this yeah, exactly. <laughs> Drawing is not set how it's supposed to be. But this is obviously supposed to be a straight line between the two. Yeah. Now, if you don't have a laser alignment tool, and you're by yourself, and these are close enough to each other, you can use a string to do this. And I'll kind of give you a demonstration, but don't just hold me to it. Oh, oh, the, the four points? The four, four points? points. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Four points, always, always four points. So you'll take your string, and go from one side of this pulley to the other side, and pull it all the way over to this side. As long as you're touching here, 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 and here, most of the time, you're gonna be lined up correctly. As long as you're, as long as you're, as long as you're across it, but where your shaft is coming out at, here in the center of both of these, is where you really wanna pull your string, so more like here, so you know that you're more centered towards the center of that pulley. They all have to touch at the same time. Right, that's the easy way to kind of do it if you don't have the laser alignment tool with you. Or if you have a straight edge, is way easier. Same, yeah, exactly, it depends on how far. The center of all axes, right? The center across what? Right, across the center of all axes of those pulleys. Yeah, you can't really do it. Exactly. Your shaft is right in the center of the way. So most of the time, whenever you're using the laser alignment, it depends. Like we have one here where... Well, I'm just trying to make sure I understand this correctly. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I want you to do. Because the alignment is super important with any motor and any fan whatsoever. It does not matter. So on your pulley... Let's see, I'll draw it like this. So that way yeah, there you go. That's how I can suggest that. That's pulley one. Shaft is kind of sticking out there. It's a case of shaft. Just sticking out a little or what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I should put that on video. 
All right, don't mind my terrible drawings. Okay, so like what you're saying, when you're looking at the shafts from, you know, I guess side or whatever the hell you want to call this angle, the front face of your pulleys are sticking out this way. So this may be your blower, this may be the motor. Sure. Okay? Yeah. On one alignment tool that you have, we put those little uh, magnetic tabs on both sides of this here. And then you have your main laser shooting off this way towards the other shaft. So when you're setting these, set one of them first, okay? But pay attention to where both shafts are. Because a lot of the times when you're looking at both of these, the shafts won't be directly across from each other. Right. The motor shaft should be sitting way back here, but your blower motor shaft is so long that it doesn't matter having to pull this all the way back that far, <laughs> okay? But on this, it's super important when you set the first one that you make sure it's spinning at zero. So those three screws that go in the front here into the bushing that pulls that pulley onto there, do not set those with a drill. Ever, please, do it by hand. It is so much easier. You can tell exactly how far you're torquing down each one of those bolts whenever you do it. Then when you spin the motor and it looks like it's spinning at zero, then you can line up your blower one. Because obviously you have to make sure that these are spinning at zero. That is a super important alignment thing, especially on one of the ones that's using a belt. If the belt alignment is off, you're gonna get all kinds of readings. You're gonna get motor wear and tear, pulleys are gonna go bad, belts are gonna go bad. There's all kinds of stuff that I can lead to. What happened to our motor? Your brother does a really good job. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean by the zero with the no, pulleys? No. Okay, so when you're spinning one of these pulleys, what I mean by the zero, this is your axis, right? Yes. Obviously, line is zero, line is zero. You want that spinning on the zero axis. Okay. If your pulley itself is, forgive me for drawing it this way, but if it's off on your shaft like this, eventually that belt is going to walk itself off of there or snap or just wear all the way out. Or it can wear out that pulley. There's a lot of things to check on. <laughs> that's, why, that's actually why I prefer the other laser alignment. You the blue see. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. You can like, the what we're talking about with the blue laser alignment is that one actually sits into, into the V shape of the pulley itself. So it comes with little V tabs. And you have to find the right size tab for whatever pulley you're doing. A, B. Exactly. Most of those pulleys have the numbers on them pretty easily for you to be able to see. You just figure out which one fits on there the best. You know the shape shape. Or the in that. Right, and you want it to touch on both sides on your pulley there. If it doesn't touch on both sides, that means that it's sitting crooked on there, which then is going to throw your laser off this way. But the other portion that goes here has three points to connect, so that way you know that this is a zero. If all three of them line up on the same black line, you know you're perfect. Which is also why I prefer that laser alignment tool yeah. as well. Yeah, because it'll tell you how the motor pitch is off. Right. If, if your sheets are out of alignment, right. it'll tell you, mm -hmm. you know, how to turn The problem with that magnetic one that sticks to the face of the pulley is that I've seen a lot of people do it <laughs> on the side of an air hammer. No offense, but the side of that air hammer is not straight. <laughs> That's not a good way to do that. Yeah, I know the little dots that are on the side of it are really small and hard to see. But that's where you kind of need to count in order to set where it would be level at. And it's hard to do that whenever you're on a roof that has rocks everywhere and all that kind of stuff. So well, I prefer the other one. And my understanding is on those little easy lasers, that mm -hmm. red that's the one we're talking about. It has a zero yes. mark. Yes. So you don't have to right. align it. Those right. other tick marks are for if there is an offset. Exactly, right. it tells you how far off it is. Yeah. yeah. No, but you need to be careful too that the walls of each of those sheaves yep. are also equal, especially with an adjustable, right. adjustable pulley. You yep. can really screw yourself up. With that. Yes. Which and I've seen a lot of people do it to where they don't want to use both the red tabs. Use both of them. Yes. If you have three of them, use three of them. Yeah. The more you have on that pulley, the better off you're going to be because then you're 
on whatever angle you're looking at that pulley, you, you won't miss it when you start to spin it. When you start to spin that pulley around is whenever you're going to start noticing how it's walking back and forth. And that's usually what we're referring to as walking. Well, and, and that's like what he's talking about. That's what those, those other tick marks are for is yes. if the pulleys are different thicknesses, mm -hmm. then you adjust per the thickness difference. Otherwise, right. you always start off at, at zero. zero on that red indicator. Yes. And that's how you'll know. Or have the other one, like I like to personally use. I call yeah, that I call that one dummy proof. If you can't get the alignment done correctly without that one, that one still got a diagnosis on it. You can look it up and see exactly what's wrong with it. Exactly. And then belt tension is huge on these cooling towers, <laughs> especially on the ones that are set up this way with the pillow lock bearings. Like I said, if this belt is over tightened. There's only two places that are going to go out. It's either these pillow block bearings or this bearing in the motor. One of those is going out, regardless. It doesn't matter. One of those is going to be taken out, for sure. So the belt will probably go bad. The pulley will probably go bad. But eventually, if you leave it that way, one of those will go out. Question for you. A lot of times these cooling towers have a six through sheet belt. Mm -hmm. and they're the, the belts they're using are like four or five. Four or five, yep. That is fine or is that something? I mean, me personally, I don't understand why they do that. I think it's more for, I mean, I think honestly it's because that particular cooling tower has several different uh, tonnages that it can tolerate, I think. So on the six groove belt, obviously if you put a six groove belt on there, you obviously have to put six groove on your motor, which then is going to be a much bigger shaft and probably a much bigger motor too. But if that building doesn't need that much cooling capability, you would then only need four pulleys, much smaller belt to run it. Because yeah. most of the time on the motor, it doesn't have. Yeah, the motor is usually. It's cooling. usually only in the cooling tower. And that's because that's what comes with that tower. So it just depends. I've even seen the ones that use the four different belts. Banded belts. Yeah, I mean, most of the time with the we're going to see banded belts. Most of the time they're banded belts. They do what? I was saying, what's a good resource for, say, um, belt tension on a six through belt like that? Like, what's we'll see. At the belt manufacturer? You know, it's not going to be, yeah, you're going to be looking at the manufacturer specs. Whatever the manufacturer specs are is what you're going to use for the tension for that tower. So the tower manufacturer. Correct. Right. The, the tower manufacturer. Not, not the belt manufacturer. No, not the belt manufacturer. The belt manufacturer will tell you how much tension that particular belt could tolerate. But not how much it should be. Right. The manufacturer is going to tell you, hey, we need this much tension between the motor and the fan for this to be running at the efficient. So I should be able to look just like my model. Right. So you know how most of the time on like uh, blower housings and all that kind of stuff, they have all the V-belt drive information on there? Usually there's a stamp, especially in these new cooling towers, there's usually a stamp right on the mechanical beam or right near the motor, and it'll tell you exactly what the tension needs to be. But you're saying if not, look up the manufacturer. <clears throat> yeah, look up the manufacturer specs, it'll usually tell you right away. It's pretty easy to find. On the banded belts though, the tension is usually a lot harder to check with those little tension pulleys that we have. The way that I normally go about it is that when you're picturing yourself centered between both of the pulleys, if you can push it in to where it's going in at least one inch dead in the center, usually that's kind of okay. If you push that thing and it's projecting your arm, obviously you're over tightening and you need to loosen it up, like quickly. Amp draw is a good way to determine that too. Yeah, you're over -amping. If your motor is over amping, first thing you're gonna to wanna to check is that belt. Because I don't believe in any case bearings can Cause a motor to over amp, can it? Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, yeah, I guess it could lock it up. I guess that would yeah, be true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, I guess if they're going bad, it wouldn't do that. Yeah. But if it got to the point where, yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, couldn't find the room, huh? This <laughs> is. <laughs> <laughs> I just brought that up. Any bearing. Any bearing. 
that is going to get exposed, take a minute, exposed to moisture needs to be what kind of grease? White. There you go. Why does it need to be white? It's moisture resistant. Exactly. It pushes the moisture out instead of absorbing it into the grease like blue grease does or polyrex, I think is the mm -hmm. proper name for it. Polyrex, yeah. polyrex is what we use on almost everything else with the exception of any bearing that gets exposed to moisture. <laughs> any bearing that gets exposed to moisture. So you're saying it's including clean. motor bearings? No. Well, so, so no. If, if the motor was inside the tower. Oh, that was an interesting question. Oh, yeah. 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 Not, not it's not going to be in the motors though, because in the motors they all require polyrex, I believe. Okay. All of, yeah, all of them use, all the motors usually have that stamp on there that require the polyrex grease. But the, the fan bearings are physically exposed right. to the air. The fan bearings and the pillow block bearings are what are directly exposed to the moisture constantly because it's directed straight over the flow of the air. So what about like supply air fans and exhaust fans? Is that I'm assuming that's still okay to use the blue? No, right. no you have to use the blue on okay. those, yeah. Because okay. they're not it's not the moisture that builds up in there is more condensation. The moisture that's building up is here is literally yeah. water being pushed Push through that tower through. into the just that high humidity environment. Yes. That's why those slinger blades that they come with, don't put them on the top, they go on the bottom to keep moisture from getting in there. You put the cream grease in there so that way if moisture gets in there, they can push out the moisture without taking out the bear. But once the moisture starts getting in there, it doesn't go anywhere. It just starts to rust everything on the inside, and then you're putting grease over a rusty ball bearing, which is you, just going to go out eventually. So you're saying the, the rubber slingers? Yes, the rubber on slingers. The bottom. On the bottom. No, 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 no. The Not the rubber slingers, those little plastic ones that they come with. To do the locking on the bottom, on the pillow block bearing. It has a slinger. The rubber slinger that you're talking about for the grease trap, that's okay. what you're talking about, right? That always goes on top. Okay. That has to be on top, actually, I think. Right. Because of the way that this, well, maybe I'm calling it the wrong thing then. So I'm wondering, I'm, I'm trying to think, so, I, so the, the rubber, the, the, the rain slinger goes on top. Right. The rain slinger, which is the one that prevents any of the water coming back in to right. the top of that pillow block bearing. So I guess I'm trying to understand what you're referring to on the bottom. It's the locking one that goes onto the shaft itself. It's got the locking collar on it, on the pillow block bearing. Oh! It goes with the I rotation did, yeah, yeah, yeah. of the shaft. So the, the, the inner race. Is that what it's called, the inner race? Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's a built into the bearing. Yes. It has the Allen. Yes, okay, that's built into the race. Yes. That always goes on the bottom and you lock it with the rotation of the shaft. If you go against it, when it spins the opposite way, it loosens the Allen wrench out and pushes it out. I've done it twice. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm letting you know now. And just so everyone knows, in the little box that it comes with, in those instructions, it tells you that specifically. So we can check it. Yes. There's a reason why there's a spot where it says you can hit it right here to punch into place. It's because it locks onto the shaft and then it tightens down. And you do it with the rotation of the shaft. Because if you go the opposite way, whenever it hits vibrations or certain frequencies and it does all that rattling, eventually it backs itself off. And then that's when you have to worry about that key stock eating into the shaft of that motor and all that kind of stuff. It's bad. I've done it. Oops. <laughs> which is also how I know about the mechanical beams because I've done a couple of towers where I thought everything was okay and it was not. Totally not one of those. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Did you cover how Very to funny. check uh, oil level in a... Um, in one of those uh, gearboxes? So in the gearbox on some cooling towers, most of them now have a hose that will go... Do you know what we're talking about with the gearbox thing? You're familiar with this setup, correct? Yes. With the, okay. Yes. So instead of your motor being out here, you will have a beam that's running across here. Okay, that's your mechanical beam I'm talking about that runs both sides. This here on this side and this side 
is where most of the time those cracks occur at because of how far away from everything it is and depending right. on how thick that metal is, everything bad breaks and whatnot. So that's where it actually attaches structurally? Yes, structurally for the tower, for the mechanical game. So on this setup, you got your motor here, you got your shaft here, usually you have a coupling here, another shaft here, and this is where we have that uh, gearbox. gearbox. On the gearbox, you have everything in here, obviously, because it's running up to turn the fan blades, okay? So when the motor comes on, turning the gearbox to turn the fan, okay? So that way it makes that 90, so that way everything's turning. There's usually a three-quarter hose or a half-inch hose here on the bottom that's running back this way and usually goes up to a little level check on if top of the tower, you're if you're lucky. There's a 90. Yeah, a lot of the times, there's usually only a 90 mounted right to the back side of it and you can just take the cap off the back side of it and stick your finger down in there if you feel oil down in there most of the time the level's okay and you want to let it be off for a little bit before you do that right, right. yes yeah because as it's running obviously the oil is all filled yeah, up inside there like not running down yeah but hopefully you have the drain pan if you don't have anything on your level of the drain for this uh i guess oil checker <laughs> If you don't have anything on there, don't freak out. Go in the tower and open up this backside here and check it out. There is another plug down on the bottom of that. Don't pull that. That will let all of the oil come out. We'll drain it into the tower. Yes. So to be clear, Casey. There's, there's, there's a 90. Call Most of the time on the back of those gearboxes. <laughs> and as a cap in it, you can pull that, stick your finger in there to check the oil. Yeah. There's also another cap right below that. That's for the drain only. Don't pull that one. Oh, yeah. You will not get it back in before most of that oil comes out, I promise. And then you're going to fill up the whole tower with gear oil. Yeah, it's uh, nasty and bad. Oh, uh, another thing too. Most. Okay, on the oil. When you stick your finger down in here, obviously if you have any metal shavings in there, that's bad. Something's going on inside of that you gear. Don't want to see any sparkles. Right, you don't want to see any kind of metal evidence inside of that oil. And on some of the newer ones now, they even have a drain in the line to where you can open that up to drain some of the oil out to be able to test for something that you think might be going on inside of there. Because just because there's metal shavings in there doesn't mean that you'd be able to physically hear whatever's grinding or whatever's going on in there. So they give you a way to be able to test for that. <clears throat> this is also where I'm talking about that pinion ring, by the way, the pinion seal. Right where the shaft goes into that gearbox, that's where your main oil leak always comes from, <laughs> most of the time. So you have the pinion one around the seal of the shaft, and I can't remember what the outer seal one is that goes around the bearing that's inside of there. But there's another seal right there. There's usually four bolts going into there. There's another seal right there. So you'll have to determine which one's leaking. It's just the seal, right? I think it is just the shaft bearing seal, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know the technical name for it. But so that one, really. right, that one we can actually, you can physically pull that out and replace it. I think the pinion seal is the one where we actually have to take it down and you have to get it to a machine shop because they have to pull the bearing and everything apart to replace it on the crankcases or on the gearbox. Motors, that's a little bit different depending on what kind of motor it is, how big it is, all that fun stuff. Oh, other thing. On the towers where you have the big giant cone on the top, what is the proper name for that thing? Oh, uh, that is... Uh... I know it's a funny name. I can't remember what the name of it is. The one that goes out the way. Any of them. Any of the cones that are up on the top where they're surrounding that blade. Mm -hmm. If there's holes in the side of that thing, write it up. <laughs> I, I forget the technical term. Yeah, I, I know there's a technical term for it, but what I'm getting at is that what that is actually doing is trapping most of the air in that tower, so that way all the air that's escaping is all of the heated air from the tower. If there's holes and stuff in there from your system, 
the water that's not made it down yet to get cooled off will escape through those holes and just completely evaporate. I mean, that's, yeah, so you should be checking, when you're doing an inspection, you should be looking for any leaks, any holes, right. anything on the cooling tower. If you see yes. green growing on the outside of the cooling tower, it's likely you have a leak. Right. Anything dripping on the outside of the tower, and it all depends, because obviously on towers like this one, for instance, they usually come in two sections. Yep. You'll have your fill and everything and the basin and everything down here from below this come in one section, and then you'll have the rest of the stuff on top come on the other portion of the section, which a lot of the times around where that meets always leaks if it wasn't sealed properly to begin with. And a lot of the times it's not really gonna matter depending on how bad the leak is. If you got water pouring out of your tower, yeah, that's bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's another thing too with all the basins. Most of your basins are now stainless, galvanized, that kind of thing. If there's water underneath the tower, check the basin first. If there's holes in the basin, that's bad. You gotta get that fixed immediately. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not gonna work correctly. And then always check the level of the water, yep. always. Even if the tower has been running for however long, check the water level. Because a lot of people don't go out to those towers very often, and you have no idea if the water is overflowing in there. Which is why a lot of the codes have now changed where you have to have a high alarm code which most of the time on the high alarm stuff is usually just a set of dry contacts letting you know hey the water's full. you don't have to get too fancy with it the tower that we're particularly talking about here definitely has a fancier system that doesn't necessarily need to be on there but what about proper cleaning <coughs> we'll see proper cleaning on any cooling tower where do you start Turn it off first, and not pressure wash everything green. No, no, no. Never turn right. It off. You can turn it off. That's obviously one of the first things you want to do. When you start cleaning the tower, first place you always start is the top. Oh, yeah, yeah. No matter what. I don't care what you're doing, start at the top. All the time. That way, mm -hmm. stuff coming down. Yeah. Exactly. Anything coming down through the fill. And if the fill can be removed, especially if you have the time and you're doing an annual or however long, whatever's in the specs or scope of work for you to do, remove that fill and spray it off by itself outside. Oh, most of your trash and gunk and everything is all gonna come from inside that fill. Yes, mm -hmm. they always, always get the calcium buildup on them, all that kind of stuff. And then a lot of the times, some of the chemical guys will come out and actually check all that stuff while you're doing it. And that'll determine for them how much more chemicals they need to put in it. At least that's I have what you're supposed to do. But I'll take the word for it. Yeah. <laughs> but it, depending on how much buildup and stuff goes into the tower is definitely how you can tell if their chemicals are doing what it's supposed to do and what it's not. It should be foamy. Right. If it's foamy, that means that the tower is probably not running like it's supposed to. Because foamy water usually indicates that the water's still too hot and that that fan isn't pulling the heat out quick enough most of the time. Or the fan can be off completely. I've seen that a hundred times. If it looks like a bubble bath inside of there, probably because the fan isn't running. And then I will state now, <coughs> uh, just so we all know, we do not enter towers while they're running. Uh, while they're running, it's, it's specifically, especially if it is a like a, 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 a rain, the rain down ground where the whole bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if, if you got to get wet to physically get in the tower, you do not go into that tower. Right. It's, it's, it's bad enough how we do it sometimes because of Legionnaires, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the risks that come with that. But um, when you actually have to go to the extent of physically getting in the water, no, we right. do not do that. Yeah, because it's typically, yeah, uh, Legionnaires are also dark in there, so you can't, outside it's extremely dark, you're not able to see what's going on there. Right, yeah, it's most easy. of the time. So, if, and, and, and that's a scenario where if a customer has a problem with that, you know, it's, I, I know that there was a time where something like that happened. I can, I can tell you buildings right now, but every time we get in the tower, it's running. I always, well, and I'm always now, keep in mind, that's not what we're saying. We're not saying don't go in a tower that's running. Oops. Don't go in one that's running, period. Like this one, 
No, no, I mean like every time I've had to go, there's certain buildings, like every time I've had to go to that building, it, they, they can't show them. Yeah, no, there's, there's usually always buildings like that. There's usually a lot of them that won't allow you to turn off their equipment during the day, which is fine. But if you physically have to get water rained down on you to walk into that tower, that's what we're meaning. We don't go in there. A lot of them, like the one that I had drawn up here a second ago, has a catwalk right in between everything. So you don't have to get wet. And then there's also other buildings that we have that don't have the other one that I had drawn up here that don't have this whole half of the tower. They only have this one here because the air is being pulled in from the outside up this way, which then you have a catwalk over on this side. Most of the towers always have a fan above your head or near you as you're entering them. Obviously, in one like this, try not to go in there if it's running, because usually there's only about two or three feet worth of room uh, yeah. between the fill and the tower. The only reason you would ever have to be in here while this is running is, I mean, honestly, no reason. No, no, no. There's no reason. No. Even if you're doing the vibration readings. Turn it off first. What you do, is you, exactly. The only thing that you'd be taking vibration readings on would be the pillow block bearings here. You know what I mean? Yeah, turn it off first. Get your little note on there. Then mm -hmm. turn it off. Because all your towers that are set up like this, where it has the draft eliminators here that you're laying on top of, they all usually have a belt. I don't think any of those tower setups have. Maybe. I've never seen no, one. I've never, never seen one oh. have a gearbox on there. Like they usually all have a belt. Those, belt. Those. Right. So normally, with it being the belt system, you would only have the pillow block bearings here. I know it's annoying, but you'd have to climb in, set your reader on there, climb back out, ramp the fan up past 45 hertz, please. That's where you want to check your vibration readings, just so everyone knows. Anything lower than that, you may not be getting an accurate reading of what those bearings you're reading at. Because obviously during the summertime, most of the time the equipment's running at 100%. You want to know what it's doing when it's under a load. When it's not under a load, it doesn't necessarily affect it as bad. When it's under a load is when you want to know what it's doing. The best so practice, always ramp it up. Best practice is just 100%. I always go at 100%, especially if you're checking balance. That's a big one. Just so everyone knows, don't balance a blower wheel, don't balance a fan. Don't balance anything unless you're at 100%. That's where you have to get your balance point at. That's how you know that fan is balanced. It has to be running at 100%. I have made the mistake of not doing that. <laughs> Big time. What else? Have we touched on hot decks? Hot decks. Oh. You're talking about the one like where you have to remove the panels on the top in order to see the... Getting all your little holes out. Getting your little holes on the top. Yeah, sure they're all wet. Mm -hmm. So that is just another setup in, of a tower, of an open loop system in yeah, particular. No yeah, that one is always an open loop Unless system. Unless you're at no, no. Because because it's where it's a closed loop, they have, a, they have pumps that run through a heat exchanger. Your, build, your tower water goes to the heat exchanger. And yeah. yeah. The tower water never goes in the building. Yep. Well, it's, it's still an open loop tower. Right. It's but just closed loop system, but it has right. two separate loops. Right, because coming off of your heat exchanger, you have a different set of yeah, condensers. Yeah, it goes in the building. Exactly, that runs back just out. Just a tower and yep. a heat exchanger. Exactly. It doesn't make the tower closed loop, it just means that they have two loops. Right. Still well, I've been tower. confused about that one too. It's yeah. like an open yeah. loop tower, a closed Which loop I'm system. actually glad you brought that up because the ones that are doing that, that's just, that has a separate heat exchanger. Yeah. If that heat exchanger gets clogged up, which they do a lot, it will cause all kinds of headaches. Yeah, I, like, I mean, you're not getting trash in the building, but you're still using an open loop tower. Exactly. Kind of cool, though. And a good way for you to know that is that if everything's running out of the tower just fine, Everything's tripping on the inside of the building. That's the first place you want to go run jet. Especially the temporary cache. And it will be on your your outgoing water will be extremely hot. That's yeah, 110 degree loop water. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, your water that's going back into the building that's supposed to be cooled down. That will be extremely hot, and that's how you're going to know. Hey, this is where my restriction is. And it could honestly be the same thing on a tower if you got a restriction in the line set. 
most of the time, not really, because the lines are usually so big that all the little garbage that runs through there usually goes through the strainer and all that kind of stuff. But so, what temperatures are you normally looking for in your cooling tower water? That's it depends. It depends on what the building is running. Like if the building is doing chillers, for instance. A lot of the times, I think the difference between the chill, uh, the condenser water going into the chiller and the condenser water going back out of it is a 10 degree split, right? Depending on the load. Yes. Right, depending on the load of the building. So that depends. If you're running 85 degrees out at the tower, then when you go over to your chiller, you're gonna wanna see that it's going in at 85 and coming out at 75, so if that's what you're going based off of. Let me rephrase the question then, at what point at what temperature is your leaving cooling tower, should you start being warm? The leaving water out of your cooling tower? Yeah. Hmm. I'm trying to think of a scenario where that would... It's, it's super situation based. Yeah, because most of the time your issue would be over at the chiller. Most of, or whatever other equipment you would be running. It could be going into a self-contained. And the answer that's inside of there is hot, which is then pushing the water back out to the tower extremely hot. But going back in, you know, is a different. The, the, the flat really situation is 80 degrees. Okay. So out of the tower. Yeah, it kind of, yeah, going yeah coming from the tower into the building. Into the building, the, the standard is 80 degrees. Gotcha. Now, the the where that can it can get more complicated than that, and if they yeah. have a variable set point based on the let bulb. Mm -hmm. Which enters into a whole other realm, which we try to do right. with chillers. Chillers, we try to set up on a variable set point yep. for condenser water. So, depending on outside air wet bulb, we adjust condenser water set point accordingly because you have to factor in coolant tower approach, which is typically five to seven degrees depending on the tower. Mm -hmm. And then you want to be basically at that approach level. So, if it's 70 degrees wet bulb, then you could run a 75 degree condensed water set point, um, which will help your chiller run more efficient. Yep. But you wouldn't, it's not very often we do that on other systems with live wires or heat pumps or self contains. Exactly. Because the chillers are more meticulous about all that stuff. That and so you also have to take into account the evaporator load. So a, a chiller, you're, you're talking 50 degree entering water at a high load, or at a standard load, I should say. With a self contained, I mean, your return air may be 75. And so if you drop that condenser temp below that return temp, you're going to start entering low ambient condition. That's a whole no. that's a whole that's thing in your question. <laughs> Alright, so this is my terrible version of the motor for you. For your question about the vibration. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Have have motor motor. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so Change the Remember what I said, five points, right? Yep. So you're gonna have your vertical, which is going to be directly on top of the bearing, or of the portion that houses the bearing on the front of the motor. What I mean by that is that usually it's a split case on most of the motors that, we do, that we're dealing with. So wherever that split is, you wanna be on the front side of that in order to read the bearings that are down in here, okay? Horizontal, obviously, is going to be the center point of wherever you're looking at this motor. Now, what I mean by that is that this one, obviously, the feet would be down here. Mm -hmm. If this was turned up to where the feet were going this way, yeah, you, you would, would be, you the vertical would still out. turn off this way. You would still know that that's the vertical. By vertical, what they're meaning is the top side of that motor, so opposite of wherever the feet are at. Horizontal can be taken on either side of that motor. It's 90 degrees. Right, just 90 degrees. Technically 45 degrees from no. where you're taking the point of that. No, it would be 90. Yeah, it would be 90. Yep. Vertical motor. Yeah, vertical perpendicular to the base. Right. Always. And on the vertical. Parallel to the and axial is always on the back side of the motor's mount. Yeah. Right, no matter how the motor's mounted. It's always got feet for you to be able to tell which way you're reading the motor. Right, and on your motor readings, 
on the equipment that we use, we go based off of IPS. On the IPS settings, once you get to, I believe it's point one, is when you're in the realm of caution. Hey, I'm starting to pick up some slight vibrations coming from fairings, shaft, alignment, pulley. You'll have to determine which one of those is doing whatever it's doing, aka taking the load off, stuff like that. So on the motor, you would be doing that vertical and horizontal on each bearing? On each bearing, on the front and the back, which gives you four points. Then you'll have the axle, which will give you your fifth point. And that one is telling, that one is usually the one that can tell you the most about your alignment, for instance. If that one is really, really high, but your bearing ones were all reading okay, it's usually telling you that something is going on with the shaft on the front side of it. So if it's on a coupling to a pump, for instance, that could be, I mean, it doesn't have to be off much in order for you to get a vibration, to be honest with you. It can be off so small that you won't even see it with your eye, but you'll know using the equipment and then you can write it up saying, hey, we need to check the alignment, stuff like that. But then of course, you can also take the load off. If that reading gets better, you definitely know that whatever's on the front of that side is definitely what's throwing off your reading. On a cooling tower, it's either gonna be the gearbox or the belt, one of those two. And a lot of the times if that alignment is off, especially on the motors where they're mounted over here on the side with that belt, if this belt is tightened up too much, what that's gonna do is pull that front bearing into the bottom side of your motor and the back bearing will eat into the top side of your motor. It's gonna tilt everything off this way and it will take it out really, really fast and you'll know it. You can physically take apart those motors and see where the bearings have been eaten out at and you'll know really quick. But it takes a lot to get to that point. So obviously whenever we're DMing stuff and all that kind of stuff, whenever we're checking it, hopefully we can catch everything before it happens. It doesn't happen within, you know, a couple of weeks span. If you accidentally have something that's bad, it's not gonna go bad overnight, let's put it that way. But we need to make sure that we're catching it. No matter how small off it is, we need to make sure we're at least writing it up. What else on the mother? Oh. On the pulley, for instance, have to make sure that's put on there correctly with the bushing. And what I mean by that is all the bushings have a threaded spot and a spot that is not threaded. <laughs> I know exactly why this came up. <laughs> <laughs> on your bushing, when you're putting it on there, you go through the portion that is not threaded into the threaded portion of your pulley, because then that pulls it onto it evenly. You can tell because Exactly, and most of the time they're tapered to the point where you can't get the pulley any further if you don't do it that way. When you go through the threaded portion of the bushing into the threaded portion of the pulley, that split that's inside of that bushing is then no longer at zero, if you want to call it. It is off, and you will never ever get it to sit straight, I promise. Especially if it's already sat there for God knows how long, you won't, you won't be able to fix it. <laughs> And then on the bushings and your pulleys, most of the time, it's always got somewhere on there where it's got the size on there. Pulleys are usually a little bit different though. A lot of the times they're on the back side, so that makes it kind of hard. So that's why I always look for that sticker. The bushing is usually always on the front, most of the time. Very rarely have I seen it on the back side. The bushing is pretty much your important part anyway, because you want to know that trap size. Yeah, well, I mean, you, so. get the, you get the actual cheap size wrong, and you're going to be Yeah. Mm -hmm. And most of the shoes, if you can get them off and actually take it to wherever you're taking it, if you can't see whatever the reading's on it, you'll be able to take it over there. <laughs> what else? You all know how to adjust all your floats and everything, right? Mm -hmm. Which kind it is on the towers and all that stuff. Yeah, the mechanical the floats, and then you have, yeah. Then you have the one that's got the sensor on it and all that kind of stuff too. Okay. What else? What other questions y'all got, man? I've seen. Um, I mean, you could go into how these electronic floats, which actually works. 
Well, the elect it depends on what kind of electronic foot switch you're using, though. Like a lot of them, if you're using the electronic one, it will have a solenoid mounted into the makeup water line. And all that that's doing is there's two, a couple of sensors inside the tower that go into the water. I'm talking about the, water. the one with the rods. That's the one I'm talking about. Okay, yeah, yeah. So the one, the one like you're talking about, okay. This is where your solenoid would go on the outside of the tower on the makeup line, okay? Which is then wired back into a control box somewhere out on the side of the tower. And then you have somewhere inside the tower where we have a PVC tube mounted and it's got, I believe, five different rods in it, something like that. Four, I think it's four. It's either four or five, but they're all different colors. In that controller, it's got, it's got, high, yeah, it's got low alarm, it's got high alarm, it's got overflow, and fill, and what's the white one? Ground, the other ground. That, is that the ground one? The white one, I believe? Oh, no, usually, well, I don't know. Yeah, high water, low water, alarm, um, fill, mm -hmm. I mean, we're below set point. Right. And then you have your ground rod. Ground rod, okay. Which, or your, or your continuity rod. So that, one, right. that one's your longest. Yep, that's the long one. That is the yeah. long one, okay. That's the continuity rod. But all of them obviously do something different depending on what application application you're using. And the controller that we normally use, all it has is a spot for your 120 volt to feed your solenoid. And then it has a spot for the sensors to run back into the same control box. But in that control box, some of them have a speaker in there to where when it reaches high alarm, it throws the speaker and goes into high alarm. Some of them have it to where when it senses that it's on high alarm, it actually kills the 122 to make that valve. And some of them have, oh man, there's so many different ones. There's all kinds of different applications that you can do with it. It just depends on what's in the tower. Now, if you're not the one who installed it or didn't know what each one of those rods does, it's gonna be really hard for you to tell which one does what like later down the road. But you can always open that controller and you'll be able to see which wire is being controlled by that solenoid. Gotcha. Which will then tell you which one of the rods on the inside of the tower is the one that's making your fill open or close. And on some of these towers that have older ones, Holden's gonna laugh at me, if the rods are touching, that solenoid will run 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> if yep. the rods are touching <laughs> each other, or if they're touching the housing. If they're touching the housing, whatever they're in, if they're touching anything other than the water, it will throw a signal to that controller to make that solenoid run all the time. And if you don't get down there and look, you're not gonna find it. What you're saying is definitely don't bend them. Yes, don't bend them as you're putting them in. Definitely, that's a pretty important spot, part. And then if you're installing these particular ones, the, the cover that goes over the top here, that comes in with those little rods, there's usually a little rubber ring around the outside of it to help keep water from going in. Because if the water goes in over the top, that's bad. You don't want that. It's only wanting to read the water from the bottom. Also, on the housing that it's in, there should always be a hole drilled towards the bottom of it and one towards the top. So that way the air can escape, so that way you know what you're actually reading in the tower. If not, most of the water that's actually in the tower will be higher than what's inside of there. Yeah, it's it's the air, exactly. It creates a vapor lock. A vapor lock, there you go. That's the word I was on the PC. But on this, what I was getting at is that there's actually two screws that get installed on the top of that. Please make sure you put those in. A lot of people don't, and that seal doesn't keep it sealed for very long, unfortunately, especially if people keep going there and pulling it in and out. I mean, it can push itself out. Yeah, and then it does push itself out too if the water goes up through there enough. It just depends. What else? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that can be on any of these lines before the tower, obviously. Obviously, you got isolation valves on all the lines going into the tower. If you don't, you want them. <laughs> Most of the time on your makeup line, you definitely want to check the uh, shutoff valve for your makeup water. If that doesn't shut off, obviously, you're going to have a problem further down the road when you need to do any kind of maintenance to that tower, even if you're going to shut it down at night. 
if that doesn't shut off, you're pretty much in trouble. It's a good idea to locate where all the shutoffs are on the tower that you're working on, no matter what, anyway. So that way, if something does go wrong, you know exactly where you need to go to do it. And most of the time, especially on the newer towers, all of them usually have a disconnect right outside by the tower for you to be able to kill power to the motor itself. If it's on a VFD, you'll want to go to the VFD first and shut down the VFD first before killing power to that motor. Because if not, it will trip an alarm in that VFD and then usually the engineer or someone's calling you being like, what's going on? Right, you want to let that fan ramp all the way down before turning off. Yeah, well, on your VFDs, that's what I'm saying. If it's not an emergency, you don't need to run down, kill the power to that motor just without going to the VFD. Go to the VFD and hit off. And most of them, if it doesn't, go ahead and set it. But in the parameters, there should be a cast down or coast down, I think, is the actual setting. You want it at least 30 seconds or higher. I personally do 45 most of the time. Because on the coast down, whenever I can usually hear the bearings really well, because that's whenever it's coming off of load and starting to back off on everything. At least. Mm -hmm. I like doing it that way. Especially whenever you're going to test them, run it up to 100%. If you don't hear anything when it's ramping up and you hit that off button on the VFD and everything gets really quiet and all you can hear is the mechanical stuff running, that's when you'll really be able to make out what sounds you're hearing a lot of the time. If you can do it that way, safely, please. <laughs> Don't be in the tower doing that, that bad. What else? Oh, when you walk up to the tower too. If there's two of them next to each other, until, for instance, the engineer asks you, hey, can you isolate that tower so I can have one of them running and the other one's not running? The only way you can do that is you need to figure out if the bases are separated. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And you definitely want to make sure the valves yes. are on both sides of those towers. If they're sharing the same basin, you cannot isolate one tower. It doesn't work that way. Unless you look underneath or somewhere else and it has an isolation valve on an equal... Equalizer um, 2, I believe is what it's called. Because it's just because it says it's open or closed. Exactly. Exactly. You got to confirm that. <laughs> by the way. Right. As long as you can isolate one of the towers, then yes, you should be good. And with it having two towers next to each other, I mean, heck, some of them have three, four, five, six of them in alignment with each other. They should all have their own makeup water running to it. It could all be coming off of the main makeup water line from the building, that's fine. But each one of the towers should have its own spot of water being made up into it, if you can isolate it. So if you see three towers and the middle one is the only one that has the makeup water running to it, you probably cannot isolate that system because that one fills up all three of them. Just because the valve's there doesn't mean it actually closes. Yes, and you need to confirm that the valve actually closes. <laughs> Definitely. Especially if you're going to do any kind of cooling tower install or demo even, especially on the demo. And the easiest way for you to do that is shut it off over at the pump, okay? When you shut it off over at the pump, then you run the pump, you're not gonna get any water back out at the, motor, at the tower, okay? On your condenser water, your isolation valve that's normally right before the tower, if that is closed, there's no water that's gonna be punching back out there through that pump. Obviously, don't leave it running that way. Then the water's just gonna deadhead and you're gonna overheat that pump. But that's an easy way for you to test it to see if that valve is closed. You can also, I mean, you can also check your PSI gauges too, right? Make sure you can, but a lot of the times those are further back, like at the pump. That pump, right. So you don't know if it's actually running yeah, out by the tower. Because yeah. most of the time, your condenser water pumps are not out by the tower. Most of the time. Right, and most of the time those gauges aren't working, all that kind of stuff. If you're in a great situation, like a newer building where all the gauges are working, then yeah, you definitely know. Also, another way is uh, temperature with your uh, uh, dry bulb or whatever you want to call it. You can check it that way too. Check the water on one side of the valve versus the other side of the valve. If you have a significant enough split, you definitely know that it's not running through there. Then most of the time, like I'm saying, on the tower, for instance, where your condenser water is going into the top. If no water's coming down from the top, the valve that you have right here on the outside is definitely closed and holding. But 
That's an easy way for you to test it. Do not close it off and then go ahead and break all the bulbs off before you verify that that water is off. You will have a bad day. You cannot get that valve back on there when the water's coming through there. I promise. So we have a question online. Mm -hmm. On a closed loop tower, what would cause the spray pump to be delayed? Like if the pump comes on and it takes minutes for the spray pump to start. Ooh, that's a good question. Wait, the spray pump? Like if the spray pump turns on? Like the, starts, so, yeah, like the building pump turns on and starts circulating right. the building water. And the spray pump is supposed to come on to cool the water out of the bottom to cool all the water right. coming back. But it, 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 but it, it delayed. Come on and, yeah, it comes on right. and delay. So the first thing that I would personally check is your strainer on the inside of the tower that's going to that spray pump. Or load, right? Is it what if it's not well, calling? Hmm? You can check your load too. Well, if it's not calling, then obviously the spray pump wouldn't be around. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying why, why would the water be delayed beginning to come down when the spray pump comes on, right? Load. Is that how I'm going to say? I would say load, right? Load? Because your I'm sequence of operations would be going through your heat exchanger, right? And then well, you would, it had to be well, yeah, when it's a closed loop, so we have a heat exchanger. Yeah, right? so it is a you would have right? your, it would go through that, and then as your temperature builds up, you would start your spray pump. Right. Your circulating pump, and then as right. it continues to build up, that's when you would start ramping up your fans. Yes, you're exactly right. It just depends. Mm -hmm. It depends on the load on the building, really, is what it depends yeah. on. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. the way I, I would think of it is, um, the, the first stage mm -hmm. of cooling is it's the, just pulling the, the water pump. out of the bottom of the basin. Right. So right. if we're below set point and we don't have fans running, we can right. kill the spray pump. Right. And then so the first stage is spray pump. Second stage would be turning fans on, and right. those fans would stay stay ramping up as it's right. calling for more. Exactly. Which would be exactly how any of them would really run, essentially. Any any of the closed loop systems with the spray pump. Because I don't think well even like some of the open loop systems, they have a bypass that will instead of sending it to the hot deck, it'll send it right back into the basin as your load builds up, that bypass will open. Right, but and see that's on the building automation side though, sure. where it's doing that. And that's usually with a three-way valve if I'm not mistaken. Because mm -hmm. that three-way valve will be wired into a temp sensor somewhere to where it's saying, hey, I don't need as much cooled water as I thought I did. The basin's it's only cool to get back into the basin, which is then not running as much energy, but not running your fan and all that kind of stuff. Which the automation can <laughs> control the spray pump too. Which, exactly. And most of the time it's going back to the VFD anyway, which is being ran off of the building automation, usually by whatever signal you're being told, which is normally 0 to 10 or 4 to 20. then you start getting outside of all kinds of stuff. <laughs> so you can pass the cooling tower now. <laughs> I mean, it's connected to all of it. So. All of it's connected back. And all that the tower is for anyone is basically just a big condenser. That's all it is. All it is is releasing really heat. That's it. Don't let the tower scare you in any way just because it's big. <laughs> well, I mean, just yeah. think of your, think of your everyday <laughs> residential split oh, system. Yeah, yeah. It's doing the same thing. <laughs> Turn it off first. Yeah, see. Yeah. Oh, we all we all I mean, the ones with the catwalk and whatnot underneath them and all that kind of stuff where you're not getting wet, it's not as dangerous to be in there while it's running, but it's still dangerous enough. I mean, you have a fan spinning at 1,800 RPMs above your head, you know, two feet above your head. So it just depends. You definitely don't want to be in there for that most of the time. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> thanks, buddy. <laughs> Is there any more questions? Or anything else that we want to go over for anything? No, thanks. On the towers? <laughs> no? Okay, I'm good. Obviously, before you install one, make sure you walk around the tower. Make sure that everything the pumps are Well, around. let's just say some towers, when you order them, the basin is not the lowest point of the tower. Oh wait, yes, I was there for that. Let's just go with that idea, okay? Walk the tower, make sure you know what you're looking at. Most of the time, towers are super 
like I'm saying, pretty simple for the most part. There's all kinds of stuff you can add into them, just like the one I just recently did where they're adding a high water alarm and you got the basin temperature sensor and then now they want the alarm for the makeup water. There's all kinds of stuff you can add into a system. But as long as you have your makeup water to fill it up and an inlet and an outlet, most of the time your job is going to run. And then of course a drain and overflow, which is usually already on the tower itself. But it just depends. They're pretty simple.